I want to welcome you to this four-part series. Um, I'm really excited and humbled to be a part of this. Marilyn, thank you for the invitation to be a part of this. You're going to have great speakers um, throughout uh, the uh, coming weeks. You're going to have Natalie Moore, uh, an award-winning journalist here in Chicago who's written a remarkable uh, book about a place I call home, the south side of Chicago. Uh, and you'll have Dr. David Daniels, one of my uh, professors in seminary, a uh, very prodigious and um, uh, wise professor of church history um, at McCormick Seminary. So um, you're going to have some wonderful speakers in the coming weeks, uh, but I'm glad to kind of kick this series off um, as a theologian, uh, as a practical theologian and a pastor uh, in this congregation. Why do I think it's important that we're having the conversation that we're having today in the church? Well, for one, it's a clear sign that we're living into our mission statement, which mentions that we, as Fourth Presbyterian Church, are called to live at the intersection of faith and life. And that's especially so when we enter into topics that really challenge prevailing perspectives of our national life. And it's also because the questions raised through the 1619 Project are vital to the realization of a just and loving public community. In this city, in this country, and uh, particularly for us as Fourth Church, the church is also, of course, larger than this congregation. It's larger than the Presbyterian Church USA, and it transcends traditions. Oh, sorry, can you all hear me now? Okay, I'm going to move the cursor off that. Um, so as I meant to say, the, the church is larger than fourth it's larger than the Presbyterian Church USA, our denomination, and it transcends traditions, geographic spaces, and times. And so it provides us with a voice that has some deliberative distance from the center of this debate, really, uh, over the origins of the United States. Meaning that the church offers a, a perspective that is at the margins of U.S. history itself. It kind of picks up on angles and insights um, that are different than the mainstream and enriches the public conversation about issues of slavery and, as I like to call it, slavery's afterlife, some 500 years since 1619. It also helps call our society to live out its highest ideals as a community. So when I mention I want to begin this conversation as a theologian, I want to let you know I'm, I'm uh, arriving at this place as a theologian who's been trained in historical critical methods of scriptural study. So that means looking at scripture and getting under the hood of scripture, not just taking the words for face value, but seeking to dig underneath the words to explore the history, the sociology of, the, of the, the biblical peoples and the biblical authors. And so I'm going to bring that into our conversation today. I also carry cross-cultural and missiological theological commitments which means that I am concerned about the ways in which um, scripture and theology speak across cultures, and that there is not one culture on this planet that, um, uh, that owns scripture or is a, a normative culture for understanding scripture. And I'm also looking at it as a missiologist, as someone who's interested in carrying out the mission of God's love and God's justice to every corner of creation. But I also come as someone who is deeply shaped by African-American identity and African-American life, and particularly life here in Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago's far southwest side. 
in the neighborhood, Morgan Park in the Beverly neighborhoods, and I lived right along what I like to call a fault line in Chicago, a fault line between white and black, between uh, working class and middle class and upper class in our city, and it ran along a street called Vincennes Avenue. How many of you have either heard of or maybe driven by Vincennes Avenue? Lived a block off Vincennes. And so this idea that um, race, culture, and ethnicity are intertwined in our local experience and our national experience is very much near and dear to who I am. I'm also shaped by um, family and neighborly relationships that speak be from worlds beyond mainline Christianity, so worlds beyond Presbyterians. I grew up with a uncle who was Muslim, with a next door neighbor who was a black rabbi, um, with uh, grandparents who were Baptists and missionary Baptists. And so uh, I'm coming to you uh, from um, someone who's experienced or at least been touched by all of those different perspectives. As Saul Bellow put it, I am an American Chicago born with all the complexities that that involves. So where do we begin today? This is what I want to talk about. Um, like many people with uh, families of Christian heritage, I grew up with a family Bible. How many of you have ever seen a family Bible, had a family Bible, many generations been passed down to you? Yes, a lot of hands being raised. So I had a family Bible. And while it was a rare occasion that I saw this little ancient artifact that was lodged up at the top of my mother's antique dresser, whenever I did, I noticed that, the, that, that, that past those listings of births and deaths was a very ornate first page of the Bible. And the well-worn pages unmistakably read, in the beginning. And the capitalized I from the word in was so ornate and large with calligraphy and even a smidgen of color. So here's the question I want us to ask today. In that grand narrative that is the history of the United States of America, where do we place that capital I? Where do we proudly or ornately point to our own beginnings as a people? This, of course, is the very foundation for the 1619 Project. Where does American history begin? Does it begin in 1619 with the arrival of the first enslaved Africans on the shore of British North America? Does it begin in 1776 with the Declaration of Independence or 1865 with the end of the Civil War? Does it begin in 1965 with the passing of major civil rights legislation that, um, in, and immigration uh, legislation, which has made the United States the, the, the truly diverse and more equal place than uh, it has been in the past and, and perhaps one of the most diverse places on the planet. Or does the beginning start somewhere else entirely? While this question is a question for nations, it's a question for families, when you look at your family Bible, for instance, it has also been a question for the church and for biblical faith, or those faiths that trace their heritage to the canon of scripture that we call the Bible. So that includes Judaism, it includes Islam. All are asking the question, where should we begin our story of faith? And I want to suggest to you today that the Bible is, when we look at it most closely, a dialogue of contested beginnings. And because it's a dialogue of contested beginnings, we should not be afraid of our own contested beginnings as a nation and even as a city. So I want to take you back in time 
imagine for a moment that uh, you are in the time of Nehemiah, okay, among those who have returned from exile in Babylon to rebuild the temple, to rebuild Jewish life in the land of your ancestors. And certainly there are all sorts of emotions running through you as you are making your way, your pilgrimage back to Jerusalem. There's there's pride in your people's resilience that you have lasted this long through persecution and exile. There's shame, of course, in having lost as much as you did. Chances are you lost elements of your culture, your language, certainly your political and social power. And one of the children in the caravan going with you to Jerusalem asks you, where did we come from? How did we get our start? Why are we coming back to this place called Jerusalem? I wasn't born there. And it's up to you to tell the history of your family and your people. So where do you decide to begin? Well, at the return in the 6th century BCE, you have access to perhaps a a wide variety of sacred stories and genres to choose from. You've got essentially the the stories and various versions of the law of uh, of the laws of Torah, right? The first five books of scripture. And you've got many prophetic writings from major and minor prophets to choose from. You've even got some of the writings like the Psalms and Ecclesiastes and Jonah to choose from, many of which kind of made their way and were beginning to be formed from your Babylonian experience. So where do you start? Might you start in Genesis 1, the orderly creation of all that exists, or maybe the garden in Genesis 2 that kind of riffs off Babylonian stories you heard in the place where you spent most of your life? Do you begin with the beginning of the covenant? Okay. Now, which covenant? The covenant made with Noah? The covenant made with Abram and Sarah? Do you begin with the Passover, the covenant at Sinai? Do you begin with Saul's kingdom, right? It was kind of a false start for the Israelite kingdom. Or do you begin with the young David's heroic bout with Goliath to show the the fierceness and pride of your people? Or imagine now that you are Peter and asked to give an account of when and where the church began. Do you decide to begin at the act of Pentecost? Or perhaps in those mournful hours when the disciples were hiding from the authorities after the death of Jesus? Do you begin with Jesus' ministry in the Galilee, or do you take the route of John and and John's community and weave the beginning of the church with the very beginnings of creation as we read it through our Christmas Eve service. In the beginning was the word. Whether you're returning from exile or starting the church, there are serious implications for where you choose to begin the story of your people and your faith. And there are many narratives that you can find in scripture that form or shape the identity of the people who subscribe to it. So I want to give you three ideas for how thematically you might begin the story of our faith and relate it to the story of our country, the story of our city. Take the beginnings of the Israelite community. If you begin in places like Genesis 3, the exile from Eden, or Genesis 12 with the calling of Abram and Sarah from their home in Mesopotamia, or in Genesis 39, with the calling of Joseph into Egypt. You'll notice a pattern with all of these stories. Can you guess the pattern? Anybody here in our chapel audience want to take a guess? What's the theme behind those three stories? Exit from Eden, Abraham and Sarah from Babylon, and Joseph into Egypt. We're talking about exile and landlessness and uh, a desire 
to find a place where one can call home. So this grounds the beginning of the Israelite story in vulnerability, in an earnest desire to seek the goodness of life, a sense of being grounded in a place that you can belong to and belongs to you and you can call your own. When all around you is the uncertainty and the instability of life under very fickle empires and warlords who could end your life in a instant. And in that sense, it's a story of the, not only the loss of stability, but, the, but not necessarily a loss because of something you've done. It is a loss in the midst of brokenness, the brokenness of the world, and it speaks to a hunger for liberation, getting from under the yoke of an empire and being free to determine one's own destiny. Now, what does that sound like? To United States citizens, residents, this sounds like the familiar telling of our national story. Right? We have come from under the yoke of the British Empire and have liberated ourselves to have a polity, a comity of a commonwealth of liberty and justice for all. And this theme extends to the Christian community in the Gospels. So if you're Peter beginning the Christian story with your own calling, you could begin it away from, you're calling away from your chosen profession. You were taken off of those fishing boats and brought into a mission which allowed you to find a sense of home. You were turned away from your home region of Galilee and sent to other parts of the world. Process of willingly or unwillingly being uprooted and rerooted. Now, a second way to think about the origins of our faith story could be in our relationship with God. And you could begin um, the story in a more flattering portrait of biblical peoples of us. For instance, we could begin with Genesis 1, right? The orderly creation and point to how human beings appear to be the apex of that creation and that male and female as they are created go on to live in harmony with themselves, creation, and God. But of course, that would be leaving out precious details of how we came from that moment to the mess we are in today. Another way of telling the favorable version is to focus on the attributes of the God who favors us. So there's a wonderful part of Hosea, one of our Israelite prophets, where the character of God who woos, who enchants, who entices God's people, as opposed to harshly judging them, is on display. So here's what God says in Hosea 2, verses 14 through 15. Therefore I, I meaning God, will charm her and bring her, that is the Israelite people, into the desert where we began, right? In the deserts, in the wilderness of Sinai. And I will speak tenderly to her heart. From there I will give her vineyards, abundance, and make the Acre Valley a door of hope. There she will respond to me as in the days of her youth. So when we and God were first dating, like the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. So to be born into a people who have this, this kind of love affair with God is indeed to be specially known and regarded. And the church, where, well, when it begins its story in Pentecost, also takes on some of this character. So where the wind of the Holy Spirit touches those who were in the upper room and their tongues of fire were given to them, and they are given authority as ambassadors and sent out to the ends of the earth. There is a closeness, then, in the relationship between God's mission and the church. We are God's special brigade, if, brigade, if you will. And there is some power we have that others do not have. So you can see how this story gives the church a lot of power, maybe less humility. You can see when we call ourselves a favored nation. Right? You see a lot of this language in the language of the pilgrims, the earliest, some of the earliest European settlers to British America. This, this idea of the city on the hill is very much representative 
of this kind of favored and chosen view of our history and our origins. But here's the last thing I want you to consider, which brings us to where we are today, here at 4th and here in Chicago, here in this country. You've got the landless approach, you've got the favored approach, but the third approach is a little bit more pointed. What if we began our history in Genesis 2, in the garden where human beings began their journey both with God but also with sin? Or what if we retold the story of Joseph? We often trace the, the history of uh, the Israelite people um, to Jacob's sons, and in particular Joseph. But what if we began Joseph's journey from Egypt, not just as if he had landed there by some unknown circumstance, but we began with the very reason that Joseph landed in Egypt, because he was sold in Egypt. To slavery. And the history of his family is one of betrayal and rivalry, thank you, and mutual suspicion. These misbegotten starting points frustrate our attempts to give the people of God a squeaky clean image. Now how about the church? Well, we could begin again, as I mentioned earlier, not in Pentecost, but in those rooms where the disciples found themselves huddled, scared in the aftermath of the crucifixion. So as John 20 puts it, when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands, his side, meaning he showed him his wounds, the wounds that he got because, in part, those disciples abandoned him and said, peace be with you. Now, that's a story of radical reconciliation, but it comes because of truth-telling, right? Because if we begin our story in a place where we, as the people of God, were fearful, it means that we begin our story in a place of humility. And if we begin our story in a place where God forgives us for the things that we got wrong, then it means that God's grace shines through who we are. It's about our identity. So it makes Jesus look gracious, makes the disciples look fearful and weak. And if we were trying to convey our movement strength, that might not be the story we would start with, right? These aimless disciples unsure of what comes next. But it's a true telling and a more complex telling of our faith story. So all of these options that I've given you for telling the story of our faith, of our people, gives us some difficult choices to make. Now, what makes the difference in our ability to tell the story well is in many ways our understanding of who tells the story, right? There's a great cultural anthropologist by the name of James C. Scott of Yale University. Anybody heard of James C. Scott? Kind of an obscure scholar, but um, one that I read during my college years. He did research in the late 70s and 80s in um, the highland villages of Myanmar. So a place where, as many of you might know, there's a war happening right now. There was a coup in Myanmar, um, and various Burmese people have been under oppression and under persecution um, since last year. Well, Scott was there up in the highlands with various tribes who were already kind of marginal to the um, Burmese community back then. And what he found was a very relevant insight to the way that we tell biblical history and U.S. history and Chicago history. Scott found that um, in the highlands where persecuted people were, uh, where, where, uh, where folks were often persecuted by the uh, government, that they had a different story or telling of their national life. These stories, as Scott called them, 
um, were more like public transcripts. So public transcripts are like official recountings of speeches or a court proceeding. These are known as the official story. So anytime you hear a press release from an official uh, government entity, whether you hear it from the mayor's office, whether you hear it from the police superintendent, this is the public transcript, right? Um, but what Scott found is that in the Highlands where he was, those were not the only narratives being told. That in fact there were narratives that, uh, that were being told by those oppressed tribes that he called hidden transcripts. And these, as he noted in his book, Domination and the Arts of Resistance, are a critique of power spoken behind the back of the dominant spoken behind the back of the dominant. Now, some 5,000 miles to the west of where James C. Scott was doing his research in a different time and with a different hill people, our biblical ancestors were also seeking out their own hidden transcripts. Those biblical authors who gave us the books of scripture, those Israelites returning from exile in Babylon and the Galileans who followed a crucified Messiah were surrounded by all sorts of public transcripts, right? There was the public transcript that made the house of David some invincible and ordained uh, entity by God's covenant. There was the public transcript that said that the Jews returning from Babylon received their freedom not from God, but from the beneficence, from the mercy of the Persian King Cyrus. There was the public transcript that said that the early church was actually atheistic from the vantage point of the Roman Empire, right? Because Christians didn't believe in the Roman gods. And yet, in the midst of this, you will see in Scripture a compilation of hidden transcripts of people who seek to tell a different story, whether through prophets like Hosea and Amos and Jeremiah and Isaiah, gospelers and letter writers like Paul. Some might call what they did revisionist history. Some might say that they were unpatriotic. Some might say that they were painting a bleak narrative devoid of any hope. But I want to suggest to you today that they were, in the words of Scott, providing a necessary corrective, a fuller history, a mode of resisting forces that would ultimately degrade their people. So. Who's afraid of sin in the church? Who's afraid of sin in the United States? Who's afraid of sin in the city of Chicago? What might these insights from the biblical stories bring to our national story? Well, for one, our national history is a collection in many ways of individual and family histories. Two of the stories in the 1619 Project struck me as particularly theologically important, and they also touched on a personal chord. The first I want to point you to was Hannah Nicole Jones' talk of her family's origins and American identity. And then the second is Wesley Morris's piece on American music. But before I begin to talk about that, I want to see if there are questions about the way that um, I'm talking about the biblical narrative and how it opens itself up to multiple origins and how it opens itself up to tell sometimes an unflattering story about its own sin, about the biblical authors and the biblical people's own sin and their own complicity. So questions here in the chapel or questions online. Joe, we do have a question in the chat that's unrelated to the question you just asked. Sure. So I will put it out there for you to address. The question is, I would appreciate a perspective on how the 1619 Project is different from the alternative 1776 history that is being used in the southern U.S. And that question is being posed by John Phillips. Sure, well, let me just speak to that a, a little bit. Um, and I know our speakers 
in uh, subsequent weeks will have, actually have a lot to say about that as trained historians. But um, from my own perspective, you know, when I look back on my own education, I was in many ways blessed to have a fairly nuanced um, reading of um, U.S. history. So I knew, of course, about 1776, studied the Declaration of, Dependent, of uh, Independence and the Constitution uh, as early doc documents, studied the Articles of Confederation. I mean, these were all required um, parts of our junior high education from seventh grade and eighth grade. Um, but I think what's the, the, but the primary difference that I think we're seeing in um, some places in the U.S., particularly in the South, as we look at how textbooks are being written and how um, curricula are being taught, and not exclusively in the South, though I might add. It's, it's, it's happening in many different parts of the uh, country. But it is a sense that um, uh, we're either going to skip over or give very, um, you know, very short shrift to the experience of slavery in African Americans, the experience of slavery and Native Americans and genocide in Native Americans for that basis. Um, but we're gonna flash forward past all that um, and we're gonna focus on the ideals and the founding generation of uh, the United States as a political entity. And I think what the 1619 Project is giving us is not simply history as a, as a number of bullet points, but really history as a series of narratives. Narratives that are deeply personal, um, narratives that are sociological, that are artistic, that are, are rich with layers of meaning. And I think that's the different spin that the 1619 Project is offering us on American history. It's not only um, the fact that different stories are being told, but it's the way that these stories are being told. Are there other questions, particularly about the biblical connections? I hope that you all will find it um, a, uh, I hope you will find it as a way to encourage you in this journey towards understanding and appreciating the fuller history of our country and our city. So let me get into a little, a little bit of what um, I've found to be particularly um, gripping in the narrative that Hannah Nicole Jones offers us. This narrative of the atrocities of slavery and segregation, roughly you know, 450 years of American history, um, but also a very personal one about her father. And as I was reading her essay, I couldn't help think about my own father, whose life very much paralleled her father. And so, I mean, it's a way of realizing that what's being told here is living history, um, ethnographic um, and sociological um, in a way that, um, almost novelistic, in a way that, that really helps us to put flesh on people um, who have long been either caricatured or just been a footnote in history. So my own father um, came here to the city of Chicago in 1933. He was um, brought here in uh, what was the first wave of the Great Migration for my own family. His family came from uh, Tennessee, from uh, West Tennessee near the Mississippi River. Um, I had the occasion once to go down to a family reunion where, uh, m where my dad's family came from. Uh, the city, it's, it's a very small rural town near Ripley, Tennessee, which is, some of you may know that as the home of Alex Haley, who wrote the phenomenal books Roots. And um, you go down to that town, actually, they had a, a t-shirt for the family reunion that, that said, Ripley, come here while it's still here, because it sits on a fault line uh, that runs through the Mississippi River. And as you all know, that fault line, as you may know, that fault line, which only um, moves maybe once in a couple hundred years, at one point um, changed the course of the Mississippi River. So that family and that community really grew up on the edge of the uncertainty of earthquakes. But they came up to Chicago um, and uh, in the 1930s 
uh, really settled in Chicago's Black Belt. So they settled in Bronzeville and moved around from Bronzeville um, to Chatham to uh, Grand Crossing where they ended up and that's where I knew um, and that's the place that I regarded as my uh, grandmother and grandfather's home uh, over in Grand Crossing. And my father, just like Jones's father, um, served, in, uh, the, served in the military. It was his way of um, gaining a foothold on the, on the world and on life and, and beginning the climb of upward mobility. Uh, came back to the U.S. from having served in Germany and in Greenland, um, a couple hundred miles from the North Pole. Um, he used to love to show me little uh, slides, and he, he was a, a phenomenal photographer, but loved slides. And so he loved to show me slides of life way up in Greenland uh, by the North Pole. Would come back to Chicago, and like Jones's father, became a bus driver because there were very few jobs and opportunities available even for returning veterans who were black from um, the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and on. So became a bus driver and then worked his way through junior, co junior college. Um, and his um, great aunt had saved up enough money to help fund his way to dental school. And so he went to uh, Meharry Medical College, which is one of the historically black medical colleges here in the United States in Nashville, Tennessee. And so in many ways, his life sort of um, uh, included the, the, the arc of um, Hannah Nicole Jones's father's life. And so when I, I look at his life and her narrative, I began to ask myself the question, you know, where do I see my own family's origins? All right? And how do we, how do I and how do we as African Americans find not only our origins, but our sense of identity and belonging in a country which, um, uh, which for you know, my father's case, um, both welcomed his service and yet did a disservice to him when he came home. So I want to ask you that, I, I want to kind of share you, uh, share with you my musings about um, what this process of sort of finding my own origins was like. And I'm going to share something with you on the screen to do that. So this is the first um, picture I want to share with you. And it speaks to what, um, it speaks to this question of what my own family's origins are like. So I'm asking myself, where does my family story begin? Obviously, my father has an important story to, to, to tell in his own life and through his own journey. Um, but where does the story of my family begin? Does it begin in 1850? And this, as you can tell, is an 1850s census. And although those of you in the chapel here are far enough away that you probably can't read all of this, I will help you as you look through this you'll note that the schedule on this census says free inhabitants of um, what is um, Alamance County in rural North Carolina. Free inhabitants of color. And so when I first saw this census in my own genealogy work, I was quite stunned. Um, this comes from my father's side of the family. 1850, the person in here is kind of about um, close to the bottom of this page. His name is Moses Curtis. And I got asking myself, how did Moses Curtis become a free black man and a free black family in North Carolina before the Civil War? And as you can see, there is the deed of the land that he owned. Um, and you can see the location, kind of hard to find now. Um, it's uh, by the waters of a particular fork. I have no idea where that is. But I got to ask myself, should I begin my family story with his story? 
the story of a people who somehow found a way to liberate themselves or to get liberated from the circumstances of slavery in the heart of the deep self, in the belly of lion's den, right? Um, how did it happen? I don't know. But do I begin my story with him if I want to um, center my identity in the story of liberation? Or does my family story begin with these two gentlemen? This is William Overton Winston, and this is his son, Charles H. Winston, of uh, Sumter County in Alabama. Uh, the Winston family uh, came to the United States in 1663 um, and uh, settled with their, um, uh, through the settlement of John Winston in Virginia. And um, they went on to, after um, one of their forefathers received land uh, after service in the Revolutionary War, they went on to move to other parts of the country, to Tennessee and then to Alabama, where they were one of the largest um, plantation families and slave-owning families in the state of Alabama. John uh, Anthony Winston, one of their relatives, uh, became the governor of Alabama uh, right before the Civil War. Uh, Charles H. Winston happens to be my great-great-grandfather, and he was the father of um, a very renowned person in my family, um, Reverend Frank H. M. Williams. And you'll note the name change, because when my great-grandfather was born, you can see this on his Social Security um, application, he was born a Winston, but then changed his name uh, after his mother married a Williams. And so this is from my mother's side of the family. And Williams, Reverend Williams, was a prominent Presbyterian, black Presbyterian pastor in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So do I begin the story here with the slave owning family or do I begin the story here with the Presbyterian pastor and his father-in-law, who I might add was a, a Presbyterian elder and um, went to a General Assembly in Montreat. So these questions I put before you because these are the same questions I'm asking myself and we need to ask our country about our origins. Um, the second piece in the series I want to point you to today and hope you'll take time to read, sheds a different light on this question of origins, and I'll close with this. It's Wesley Morris's introduction to the complex origins of American music, and begins, he begins his piece from an interesting angle. He begins his piece on the history of American music with something known as yacht rock. How many of you are fans of or have heard of yacht rock? All right, let me hear, who, who knows what Yacht Rock is, or who would define it for us? Yes, Yacht Rock is easy listening rock from the 70s, which you might enjoy with a Chardonnay on your boat or someone else's. Exactly, exactly. Easy listening music, right? Um, you can channel for it on uh, Sirius XM. Okay. Yeah, you can find it Sirius XM. Uh, Pandora, as Wesley Morris notes. Um, you can find it on Spotify. And I gotta admit, some of it is catchy. And I've actually grown up not knowing that, um, uh, uh, not knowing that like I've been listening to Yacht Rock since I was a baby. Uh, my, I, my older brothers, I have brothers who are 15 years plus older than me. And so I listen to a lot of old, <laughs> old soul music. And I, I listen to a lot of Yacht Rock. Um, little did I know. But there's a history, of course, with this, right? That um, Yacht Rock and some of its stars, like Kenny Loggins, Ring the Bell, Michael McDonald, um, Bobby Caldwell, these are folks who are white, and yet if you listen to their music, it's unmistakably black and African American in character or in genealogy. In fact, there's a whole history, there's a whole uh, there, there are several YouTube 
links you can find and Twitter threads you can find, particularly on black Twitter, about um, the first time that uh, people found out that Bobby Caldwell was white and not black uh, when he wrote his famous song, What You Won't Do For Love. I encourage you to YouTube it and look it up. Um, but anyway, Morris asks, how did these white musicians sound like they just came out of black clubs on Saturday or black churches on Sunday? And indeed, he comes to show us that it is the sound of black music sowed in the African-American experience that is, very quinti that is the very quintessential sound of America. What began as work songs in slavery, what began as spiritual songs in slavery, in the blues, all from enslaved Africans, then became parodied through minstrel shows from white audiences and white musicians who looked to humor themselves with the caricature of black culture while being enticed with, at its core of beauty and truth. And then an, an, and had an animus for what they both loved and hated. As Langston Hughes said, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. And that's exactly what those who did minstrel see were. But eventually black, black music breaks free of the bonds of white minstrelsy and begins to own its artistic freedom in places like Motown, Detroit, and Chicago. And that's where the Chicago connection comes in. The beginnings of gospel music are here with Thomas A. Dorsey, Pilgrim Baptist Church in Bronzeville. It's still there. And Thomas A. Dorsey not only was a gospel artist, but was a blues artist too. So he, he personified the club on Saturday, Saturday night, and the church on Sunday, Sunday morning. There's the soulful sound of Sam Cooke, who spent most of his life here in Chicago. His father was a pastor at a, a congregational church in um, Chicago Heights. Got his start singing in the choir, similar to the sound of, or, or to the start of so many soul singers who came after him. Mahalia Jackson, a semi-contemporary of Thomas A. Dorsey, uh, and got her start singing gospel music and essentially the beginnings of soul music here in Chicago. All of these figures transcended the world of church and club, sacred and secular, frivolity and faith, the erotic and the ecstatic vision. The history of American music from the blues, the spirituals, the folk music, to minstrelsy, to rock, to jazz, to soul, demonstrate just how closely we are linked as a country. Albert Murray, who's a wonderful cultural critic I encourage you to read, he has a masterful work, it's a very complex one, called The Omni-Americans. And in this book, he says that indeed, for all their traditional antagonisms and obvious differences, the so-called black and so-called white people of the United States resemble nobody else in the world so much as they resemble each other. And it's the music, right, that, that, that gives us that sense. But here's what this did for my own family story, my own quest for origins. It told me that to find my family origins, just like to find American origins, one cannot simply look in one place or point to one specific time or even one people. One can find America in many places. One can find the origins of America being practiced by slaves and indentured servants from Africa. One can find it in Native American tribes, persons on the frontier uh, in British colonial America. In fact, you can find America being practiced among the Fulani and the Ashanti peoples of West Africa and the Seneca of North America and the religious dissenters of Rhode Island. Just as you can find the reform, the Reformation's origins in the Waldensians who practiced the kind of Protestant flair that um, the Reformation was known for centuries before it. Or you can find the origins of God's people in Abraham and Sarah and Noah and his family and Saul as well as in David, in all their flaws and all their ideals. So at this point I want to pause and see if you have questions or thoughts about what I have offered you both my own personal meditations on um, what the 1619 Project has caused me to think about with regard to origins, 
but also what the biblical story tells us about origins. So not just questions, but also thoughts, comments, either online or here in the chapel. So there is a question in the chat, and the question is, is there a sense of the extent to which churches and pastors in the pulpit are fomenting opposition to the 1619 narrative versus those who encourage their parishioners to be open to it? Is this even an issue within American churches? Yes, I would say it very much is an issue in the American church, but it very much differs by, um, very much differs by denomination and tradition. So um, you don't need to go far, but if you look, for instance, I believe it's First Baptist Church in Dallas, um, you'll find a very um, quote-unquote patriotic um, and um, um, 1776 based version of American history that essentially whitewashes and I do mean whitewashes um, a good deal of the trauma and the foment and the the antagonism the contestation that formed this country um, sometimes it's creative tension but it avoids all of that tension and it's being given from the pulpit of a prominent Baptist church uh, so this is an issue for the church, and I think it just differs from denomination to denomination and from tradition, but I think we need to find ways to equip all of our people, right? Because we're all going to have a different slant on it. We're all going to have, based on our region, based on ethnicity and race, different ways of talking about this, but we're all going to have in the church to find on-ramps to this conversation, to complexify our history. And I really hope that it's through understanding that our scripture, our Bibles, are having the same conversation, that we can open the way in the church to this m more complex and more truthful telling of our history. So thank you for that question. Yes? When you think about the origin stories that you were discussing in the introduction the Bible, and then the origin stories you were talking about the world how do you decide That's a good question, and I'm still root. Oh, sure. So just to paraphrase that question, and it's a very good one, when we think about the origin stories that I shared from Scripture, the origin stories that I shared from my own family history, where do we begin and why? Where do you place the emphasis? I think that's a great question, and one of the things I've been leaning on is thinking not just about our history as a way to understand our identity or who I am now. That's certainly one question I've been asking a lot, right? And it's the question that led me to my faith. It's the question that led me to Presbyterian ministry. But um, another way to think about it is how does our history help us think about our future, about our destiny? Um, when Hannah Nicole Jones says in um, her essay that essentially the ideals, right, of, of freedom and equality, or liberty and equality, were false when um, they were first spoken in 1776. Um, I wrestled with that, right, because I, I felt a little bit of tension, like, really, truly? Um, and I think it depends on how you read the statement. So one way to read the statement is to say, this is a statement about um, the fact that uh, these qualities, these ideals were false because they weren't truly practiced. Another way to say it is these ideals were false because they can never be. And so that's the destiny and the future question. And to my mind, we want to start the story in places, and it's often multiple places, that help us to chart a path towards a future, a sustainable future, um, to help us chart a path towards our destiny. So when I gave you the, the biblical narrative, I mean, you can kind of see how that gets shaped, right? Like a landless people becomes a people who find a place called home and belonging. A people who um, are favored by God continue to find a way to fall in love with God and God to fall in love with them. And uh, a, a people who um, are marked by sin and wrongdoing and regret and failure find a way to be reconciled and redeemed. 
So if we believe in those things, we believe in reconciliation and redemption, as hard-earned as those things can be, right? Those things come through truth-telling. Then there is a purpose in beginning our origins um, with uh, mention of that sin, with mention of that wrongdoing. Uh, So I, I tend to lean on having the more complex story and having multiple origins that kind of lead into some primary narratives so that we can point to what our destiny is as a people, as a country, as a city. Um, And I I kind of theologize that a little bit. I think about it as a a destiny um, through which our national community, our local civic community, our instantiations, right, are, are, um, are in some ways mirrors of the kingdom of God, right? The beloved community. Um, So that's my hope. And so that's why I think in order to think about where to place the emphasis and the origins, you have to think about where is our future? Where is our destiny? Yes. In the back. Sorry, I'm not going back here, but um, I remember David Daniels in the church history said that um, history is just by the victor, number one. And then secondly, um, how do we find the minority story, and how do we get others to take them seriously? Like I know, for example, the part of the reason that textbooks are the way they are is the state of Texas buys them in bulk for the entire state, and so our history books are being written by who we can sell the most books to without having mm-hmm. to change the words in them. So how do we? Good question, and I and here's a couple of thoughts. Oh, you, on, you, you, oh you yep, sorry about that. So the question is, you know, how do we change? How do we change the way in which history is being told and taught in our schools, um, particularly the experience in Texas where the state buys in bulk textbooks, and so therefore has a kind of um, uh, has a has a, a, a Yes, has a monopoly on the way in which history is being taught. So how do we change that? How do we offer alternatives? Well, I think one is a question of um, missiology, actually, missional engagement. And that is we as, you know, I always love to say that, that Presbyterians are a, um, are, uh, represent a public church in the sense that we don't believe that um, the teachings of Christ apply merely to our private lives. They apply to our public life as well. And so that demands that we get out there in the public realm, in the public sphere, and seek to um, engage our neighbors, seek to shape and influence public life. And I think some of that has to happen in our local school boards. Uh, You know, I've been a part of, for instance, um, a conversation happening in um, our, uh, in our school district, um, we're in the northern suburbs in Skokie, and we have a diversity committee on our um, school board, and I've been involved and had some conversation with them, but it really does start at the grassroots level, because there are other folks within the school district who are like, I'm not so certain about my kid being taught about slavery and segregation in, in, in certain ways. Um, and the only way you're going to challenge it is by having one-on-one or small group conversations at that local level to be able to say, well, here's why I think that story is important. Let me tell you about my family's history. Let me tell you about what they went through. Let me kind of depoliticize it a little bit and um, find, a, a, find a place where there's common ground. So it's important for us to get involved in our school districts. Um, so that's one piece. And then it's important to us to use the church. I mean, we have um, an incredible, you know, we have incredible access to media now, particularly because of this pandemic. I mean, we're doing this on Zoom. We have uh, the capacity to get on YouTube, the capacity to create videos for ourselves. We can teach that history. We can put it out there. We as a congregation, we as a presbytery, we as collections of congregations, we as interfaith communities, right? Um, with our Jewish and Muslim and Hindu neighbors, we can tell those alternative histories of the United States. 
One of the uh, previous organizations I worked with, Interfaith Youth Corps, was all about that, figuring out how do we tell the story of interfaith America. So we have the power through our media to tell different stories, to hear different stories. And I guarantee you, all you gotta do is, I mean, my story is one, but I guarantee you, you know, every African American member of this congregation or participant in this congregation has, an, uh, has a, a story just as phenomenally interesting, um, if not more so than, than my own. Other questions or comments about where we are? Yes. In the book, um, they talk about, or when you think about America, the Northeast was settled by a different group of people than Virginia was, than Georgia was. Mm -hmm. And the book sort of pointed out that in our national origin story, they sort of focus on the Puritans as being the, the actors and the motivators, and they sort of discount the planters in Virginia. Uh, and whether that's really conscious to make it sound like a, an uplifting religious uh, founding of the country versus an actual founding of the country. Oh, yeah. That, I actually wrote a... a uh, so, the um, question is about, uh, really comment too, about um, how we distinguish the um, history being told about our country and its origins from the Northeast, from the, the, the sort of pilgrims story, the religious dissenters story, versus um, the story of the planters, right, in Virginia, uh, the penal colony in Georgia, right? There, there are different tribes, if you will, who have come to this country from Europe who have spawned different origins, different origin stories. Um, I think that's a, um, it's a good point, and I wish I remembered the name of this book, and it will, I'll look it up and maybe I'll add it as a resource for this series, but there was a great book that I ended up um, using for a um, seminary project I worked on about this very topic of origins, particularly re religious origins. And essentially, the, the thesis is um, that um, if you go back to the British Isles, and you look at particular regions in the British Isles, particular cities in the British Isles, that you will find the origins of the various different migrations that came to the United States. And you will unravel some of the mysteries of the differences between those individuals. So when you look, for instance, at the Scots-Irish, um, who um, were part of those planting communities that came to the South, and the ways that um, even the ways uh, that they shaped their material culture in the British Isles, right? That they, um, they would, um, uh, they would uh, build their homes on estates, essentially, that were further apart from each other. And you can see that material culture mirror, mirrored in the way that settlements were made in Virginia and the Carolinas, right? That, that you have these estates that were all sort of set out, set apart from each other, that there was a uh, kind of, um, a kind of focus with regard to etiquette and manners on sort of deference, right? And you can see that deference in the way that um, uh, certain groups of Southerners re relate to each other. So, I mean, I think there is something important to those multiple origins, and that those multiple origins existed in Europe just as they existed in other parts of the world, right? Like, and the origin story keeps happening, right? We, 1965 was a different origin for the United States, and it genuinely spawned a different America than what came before it because of the Immigration Act of 1965. Uh, there's no way I would have had the experience of first and second generation immigrants that I had as a child. No way would we would have that in our workforce, in our schools, um, in our communities and neighborhoods now before 1965. So these, these multiple origins, whether they're in Europe or in other places, are very important to keep in mind. Other questions or comments or thoughts are in the chat as well. Maybe I'll find that book if I can. Uh, so there is a question in the chat. Uh, the person is saying that they're just starting the book. Is there a particular chapter or chapters to read in preparation for next week's session? 
Oh, that's a good one. You know, I would say, given what Natalie Moore, what her, um, uh, what her experience and specialty is in, um, what she has journalistically chronicled, chronicled for us, um, I would take a look at um, some of the pieces on um, particularly issues of land and issues of economics um, because they speak uh, particularly to the heart of um, issues that um, really make the South Side what it is and what it was um, and uh, really speak to the heart of economic inequality and this is something that she really addresses um, in her book on the South Side and in her ongoing reporting as well. So I would look at um, the text and I'm gonna kind of point to some of those here, but um, look at some of those texts on um, economics and some of those texts on land. Um, and I think those will be important for next week. By the way, the book that I wanted to tell you about earlier is called Albion's Seed. Albion's Seed, Four British Folk Ways in America. Um, and it's just another way of reminding us how contested and multiple origins are nothing new, um, but they're always with us and, and they'll always be with us and we'll need to hold on to them um, in, in uh, so many ways. Here's another book that has been recommended in the chat, chat and the name of the book is American Nations by Colin Woodward. Woodward. Great, that's a, a great addition as well. Thank you for that. And maybe as the weeks go on, we can come up with a little list that we can all share with one another of additional reading on top of the 1619 Project or um, books and articles that the 1619 Project leads us to. And I'm happy to add to that as well. All right, well, I do want to thank you all again just for the opportunity to um, share a little bit of my personal story, my family story. It's not something that I'm necessarily used to having up on the big screen and sharing some of those photos with you, but those are meaningful to my own family's history. I want to um, uh, give, uh, um, uh, give due acknowledgement to my aunt, my aunt Marquita, who is our family genealogist in many ways and got me on Ancestry.com and started me on the path to, to learning about our origins. Curiously enough, um, she's actually met the white side of our family um, and had an uh, interesting reunion with them uh, on the very plantation that my great-grandfather was born on. Um, perhaps another story for a, another time, but um, all to say, um, I, um, I, uh, I, I count it as a, as a special thing to be able to share that family history with you, um, as well as these broader insights on how our faith story, how the biblical story leads us to embrace the kinds of complexities that the, the 1619 Project um, brings to us.